you turn over to uh, Hebrews I need to organize here I think last time I'd uh, said that the first uh, four verses, there were uh, seven great statements. We won't go over those again, but we'll still be in, in this section. So uh, open your Bibles there, the first uh, chapter. Before we start, though, let's have a short word of prayer. And Father, we are thankful for this study, for the record that has been left to us, that guides us. We pray, Father, that each of us may gain from this lesson those things that are beneficial to us in the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May thy blessings be on us as we engage in the study, and may the knowledge we gain may, may be useful. May it be useful in the service of our Master. In his name we pray. Amen. I think I may have said uh, last time, and uh, we read here, God at various times, in various ways, spoken times past to the fathers by the prophets. And of course, the uh, Jews held the prophets in high regard, as in these last days spoken to us by His Son. And I might add that He only speaks to us by His Son, and of course. Uh, by his ambassadors, the apostles. You know, we, somebody mentioned something about the apostles' doctrine. Uh, so that's, that's that's the only thing that guides us today. There's no uh, little voices, no urgings. There's no latter day apostles or prophets. None of that. So, and this is the point that Paul is. He's the writer, and we'll just assume that he's the writer of Hebrews for a further discussion. Uh, that's the point that Paul wanted to get over to the Hebrew Hebrew Christians at the time. There's nothing else. This is it. If you abandon Christ and go back to the law of Moses, God is not going to be speaking to you. But anyway, he says in verse 2 here, he's, he's appointed uh, heir of all things. And, and one of the things that uh, I think I mentioned last time is that typically the way that works is that uh, the father or the, the parent of you know, whoever has the, has the goods, they got to die first. <laughs> and, it, and it's the lineal, what we call the lineal descendants, they're the one that gets the goods. If they've been nice and it's included in the uh, will. But this is not the case here. One thing is, you know, God cannot die. It's an impossibility. But Jesus, the man God, or the God man, whichever order you prefer, uh, he could. And of course he had to in order to be that sacrifice that perfect sacrifice for the sins of man. Man couldn't do it himself. But because he did that, he was appointed heir. And what did he gain? Well, he gained all the uh, saved. He was the uh, head of the church. He gained quite a bit. And, of course, we as Christians gain quite a bit from his heirship as well. And it said also that uh, through whom, that is Jesus, he made the worlds. Um, now, when we say made the worlds, he made everything substantive in the world from nothing. 
Now, not only did he make the world bring the material out of nothing, he set up the, um, we call them laws, natural laws, the way things work, he set that up as well. And uh, I think anybody that's ever looked into this is very, very complicated. Uh, there are th still things we're discovering about the physical world, and I assume that that discovery will go on until time is drawn to a close. But he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory in the King James, I think the ASP also uses the word effulgence, which is not one we use often, but it, it has the same idea here. It, it's a very bright light, like the sun, very bright. You don't actually see the sun, because you'd, it'd blind you if you look directly in the sun, but you see everything the sun illuminates. And so Jesus is the brightness of the Father, and so he is illuminating the Father. Like like we uh, I read the uh, passage where he had to tell Philip, you know, you, you want to see the Father? You see me. We're exactly the same. But we're not, we're not talking about a physical likeness. He says the express image of his person, Jesus, is the express image of his heavenly Father. Again, it's not a physical image. Because God is not, does not have uh, uh, a physical form at all. And Jesus, whatever he looked like as a human, is not what God the Father looked like. You know, it kind of said in Scripture that he's not going to be anyone that, he's not going to be a very handsome man. So we're not talking about, the express image is not the uh, physical uh, aspect of, of uh, Jesus that is like his Father. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. You know how powerful the word is. And all the thing that sustains this world is the word of God. If there is no word of God, there is no world. And when he had by himself purged their sins, and you can use the word propitiated or expiated, uh, but it was through his sacrifice, he was the uh, he was the only offering that can result in the ultimate and final forgiveness of sin, because his blood washed away our sins. But in order to do that, of course, he had to come, uh, leave heaven, and become uh, the God Man or Man God and be subjected to the temptations of this world and to die innocent without sin and thereby qualifying him to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. So he purged our sins and it's at that time that he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Majesty just uh, means uh, God the Father. And, but he's at the right hand. The right hand is always in, in ancient times, and maybe it does now, I don't know. It uh, indicates authority and power. If you somebody's sitting at a king's right hand, or maybe the prince or whoever it is, they have a lot of authority. They have power. Don't mess with them. And sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels. Now, angels here, um, it's the Greek word angelos, and it's typically what we think of as angels, the, the heavenly beings. And He's saying that he's better, or Paul is saying that he's better than those, better than the angels. 
And of course, the uh, uh, Hebrew Christians would have considered angels uh, as ones having great authority, very high, high spiritual beings, if you will. And if the heavenly angel speaks, you, you listen. But Jesus is better than those. He's better than them. And again, by inheritance, he's uh, received a, or attained a more excellent name than they. Whatever name that they, the angels have, Christ's name is better. And uh, again, by uh, uh, he became the heir and and is dying and uh, suffering death and is being resurrected. He received that inheritance. He received a more excellent name because no angel ever died on our behalf. No angel ever became the uh, man here and you know lived a life as a man subject to temptation and so forth. No, no angel ever did that. So he obtained a more excellent name than they obtained. Now, when we say that he uh, is so much better than they are, all throughout the letter of uh, or the epistle, again and again it is uh, drilled into the people that Jesus is better. Whatever it is, is better. Here in verse 4 it says better than angels. In verse uh, chapter 6, verse 9, he's better things. He uh, brings better things. <clears throat> in verse uh, chapter 7, verse 7, the lesser is blessed by the better. And of course, Jesus is doing the blessing, so he's the better. In chapter 7, verse 19, he's a better hope. In chapter 7, verse 22, his covenant is a better covenant. In uh, chapter 8, verse 6, it also says that his covenant is a better covenant, and it's based on better promises. In chapter 9, verse 23, and better sacrifices. In verse 10, uh, verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 34, better possessions. In chapter 11, verse 16, he speaks of a better country. And in 30, cha verse 35 of that same chapter, it's a better resurrection. And in chapter, uh, verse 40 of that same chapter, there's uh, something something better. In chapter 12, verse 24, there are better things than Abel. And you may recall that Paul said in uh, Philippians, the uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 23, that he has a, has a desire to depart and be with Christ which is better. So to be with Christ is better. And this is the thing that Paul is trying to impress upon the uh, Hebrew Christians that Christ, from whatever perspective that you want to consider it, he's better than what you had before under the mosaical system. He's superior. He's superior in rank dignity, superior in reverence compared to any angel. He's superior. He 
says in um, verse 5, let me get to that and I'll read it to you first. Uh, 5, he says, For which, to which angels, of the, which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Well, the fact is, uh, didn't say that to any angel. In that particular uh, verse, when it says, This day I have begotten you, it says in Romans uh, verses 1 through 4, he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of Holiness by the resurrection from the dead. We should not minimize at all the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he could have lived perfect life here. He could have gone to the cross and shed his blood. But if God had never raised him, he would be for nothing. So the uh, resurrection was the crowning event in the... Uh, um, the power that uh, Jesus had, that he was uh, uh, was uh, uh, invested with because he was resurrected from the dead, and that's God the Father did that. <clears throat> he says, today I have begotten thee. We might look at uh, Psalms, that comes from Psalms, the second, uh, second Psalm, verse 7. And a lot of the scriptures that you find here are from the Old Testament. And I must add uh, that it's from the Septuagint Old Testament, not the uh, Hebrew Old Testament. He says, I will declare the decree, decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son today. I have begotten you. So the fact that it's repeated in the New Testament means that it's a messianic uh, prophecy. <clears throat> he says I will be to him a father and he will be to me a son and that comes from well a number of places but uh, 2 Samuel 7th chapter verses 14 and it reads there when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seat after you, you who will come from your body and will establish his kingdom. He shall build me build a house for my name, and I will establish a throne for his kingdom. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the son of men. Now, one thing I must point out is that all of this, this has actually been spoken of uh, with regard to uh, Solomon. And Solomon's one going to build, build a house in this time. But the fact that this was quoted in Hebrews means that it, at least one aspect of it is messianic. Now the question that arises is when he says if he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with a rod. Well, Jesus never committed iniquity. So how can this apply to Jesus, even though it, it obviously is because it's quoted in Hebrews? Well, that's one of those things where you have a uh, uh, double reference, if you want to call it that, where it's referring to two individuals. Obviously, it's referring to Solomon, but because it's quoted in the New Testament, it's, it, at least part of it is referring to Jesus, not the one about iniquity, because he had no iniquity. David, uh, of course, wanted to build a temple. He wasn't allowed to do it because he was a man of war. And 
Jesus desire to build, build a spiritual house but that spiritual house was built after he was after he died and was resurrected and that of course that spiritual house is the church and this spiritual house the church will it's not a temporary you know the uh, Solomon's temple and Zerubbabel's temple, and which eventually became Herod's temple, those are all temporary. They were never intended to be there permanently. But this one is. The church is there forever. And a unique thing about the church is, you know, the, uh, the temples in Jerusalem were only for the Jews. This spiritual temple is for everyone. There is no um, uh, delineation by race. Creed is certainly uh, important, but it's available to all people. And that's, that is not something that uh, would have happened uh, to the temple in Jerusalem. And you recall, I think we uh, read it before, where the Jews thought Paul had brought a Gentile into the temple. What a riot that caused. Well, it's not, that's not the same thing with the church. The church is open to anyone and everybody as long as they render obedience to uh, our Lord. In Isaiah, the uh, 53rd chapter verses 4 through 11 again it's fifth chapter of course talking about uh, uh, Jesus certainly he has borne our griefs and carried our sor sorrows yet we esteemed him strictly as we go through here you can see how it's referring to Jesus yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who would declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken, and they made it his grave with the wicked. But with the rich had his death because he had done no violence. There was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. And when you make his soul an offering for sin, you shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. And it describes our Savior uh, pretty well, pretty well. <clears throat> In verse 6 of uh, Hebrews 6, Hebrews first chapter, but when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Now one question that arises when he says, when he again brings the firstborn into the world, when is the first time that he brought the firstborn into the world? Now there's a couple of ways you can look at this. You can say, well, once again he's going to quote a... a uh, scripture from the Old Testament 
But he, there may be a, a second time that uh, Jesus is going to come into the world. And when can that be? Well, it could be uh, when he's uh, resurrected. You know, he left the world. He meant he was brought again into the world. That's a possibility. <clears throat> And you recall at the destruction of Jerusalem, that's described as a, a coming of Jesus, so that could be another uh, deal. But whenever uh, it has to be, it's modified by the phrase, let all the angels of God worship him. So whenever he again comes into the world, the angel is going to worship him. And I would say that that's uh, at his resurrection. Now that comes from the 97th Psalm, uh, verse 7. And it reads there, Let all be put to shame who serve carved images, who boast of idols. Worship him, all you gods. Now I need a little explanation here. Uh, this word gods is plural, but it's uh, the, the Hebrew word Elohim. Elohim. And that's the word used throughout the uh, Old Testament to refer to God. But you look at uh, Hebrews 11, chapter verse 6, it doesn't say that. It says angels. So what, what gives here? Well, again, keep in mind that the uh, Old Testament passages being quoted in, in Hebrews are from the Septuagint. And when the Septuagint was translated, they translated this word, angelos, angels. So, and I would say, uh, it's still a superior being. It, it's still that. And if it were God, uh, you know, certainly God is not going to worship God. So the translators of the Septuagint, who are much closer to the time of um, this writing than we are, they elected to trans translate it as angels. So we can go with that. The angels are to worship Jesus. Let all be put to shame who serve carved images, who boast of idols. <coughs> And, of course, that would uh, uh, obviate any sort of uh, worship by the Hebrew Christians of something other than uh, God their Father. And so he's talking about angels. Angels will, and he said, we've already gone through that before, angels will worship him. And again, in Romans, the first uh, chapter, Romans verse 4, he was declared to be the uh, Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. That culminated it. And he goes on to say uh, uh, in verse 7, in other angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? In verse 8, But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Now, what does it mean by make your angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? He's saying that about the angels. And really what he's saying is that these are superior beings. They have a lot of power. They're spirit beings. And they have a lot of power, the ministers of fire. But even then, they are still not on the same level as Jesus Christ. And when he says a scepter of righteousness, you know, you think of uh, like uh, the kings, of the kings and queens of England. You know, they'll have 
something they carry around that does something. Got a lot of jewels in it. Very valuable. But it's a scepter. It's a, it's a sign of authority for the king or queen. But his scepter is going to be righteousness. That's going to be his authority. And it's going to be the scepter, the sign of his kingdom, righteousness. So we'll start with uh, verse uh, 9 next time.